Let me start with these two questions here real quick, just to get a sense about the audience. So who here uh, uses DVT core nowadays? Raise your hand. Okay, 30% of people. Uh, and what about, who knows about the astronomer cosmos? Okay, that's good. So that's the expectation. So I was just, that's gonna be an introduction level session. So I'm happy that we are at the same level and, and we're setting the stage correctly, right? Well, for those that doesn't know what DBT is, so DBT is a wrapper. It's, a, it's something really unique and something that completely changed the game on the data ecosystem. Because back in 2013, 14, where we used to have Spark, um, and it used to be super famous, right? Um, it's basically spread everywhere. We start to see the rise of DBT. And DBT basically leverages the horsepower of the data warehousing. So then you can write your SQL statements and you just offload the query to the um, data warehousing. So DBT basically uses this idea of leveraging the power of the data warehousing. And normally we see this type of project happening more in the modern data stack. I don't know if you guys heard about MDS. So yeah, the, the idea is just, just make simpler, right? So um, back in the, in the days, we used to have like a centralized data engineering hub in, within the company. And then basically what started to happen is that we start to spread out the data in different places and just making each one of the people being able in departments be able to leverage their own analytics. And then we ended up with this modern data stack. But not only that, we just, at the, at the IT field, we, we saved a lot of storage costs and also we saved a lot of storage uh, of processing cost. So that's why people started to push data into the data housing straight. So this sounds a little bit awkward when you're like a more data engineer just back in 2010, whatever. It sounds scary because now you're just bringing all the data through the data housing. So yeah, there's like people that loves and hates, but yeah, there's a use case for everything. But this is DBT pretty much. And you, they, they offer different uh, data warehousing connectivity. So for example, Synapse Analytics, Azure Databricks, Clicky House, Microsoft Fabric, uh, you name it, right? So Postgres, so basically you can connect to any data warehousing system out there. But the challenge is, okay, people started to use a lot of DBT, but on the flip side of the coin, we have the people, the data engineers that used to use a lot of Python. And we know that Airflow is beloved for everybody in the community and is spread worldwide. And then we start to ask ourselves, well, how we would interact the Airflow with DBT projects, right? And a couple of years ago, we didn't have like any package that would make this easier or seamless for people to use. So back in those days, we used to have only the bash commands. So we used to have DBT run, DBT, um, seed, whatever, all the commands. That used to be a little bit hard to do it because if you would have like lots of uh, DBTs, uh, models to run, that would be a little bit cumbersome to do it. So when we think about this left side where we have more data engineers using Python with more complexity, evolving uh, ecosystem, on the flip side of the coin, you have the analytics engineer kind of thing that uses a lot of DBT. And then it offers like, a different way of thinking, right? Because here you're thinking more in a Python, a structured way of building the code, and here just thinking about SQL, a uh, structured language. So how should we combine them? How we should do this, right? So in the end of the day, the, the question that lives is how to run DBT core projects in Apache Airflow. And yeah, that's where the astronomer Cosmos comes to rescue. So Cosmos is a library that makes super easy for any data engineer or any analytics engineer to author their DBT project. And they make seamless integration between them. So as you can see, we use the same logic and the same idea of Apache Airflow. It doesn't change a bit. But then you can basically say where your project resides and then you give some external parameters, some, some additional parameters that I'm gonna show you right after this, this one. And then there you go you should have your DBT project running, right? And that, that's amazing. So it looks super simple. It is, there's a bunch of things that runs uh, underneath the hood. And it makes super easy for us and abstract the complexity that um, it is actually to run the DBT projects. 
So if you think a little bit about the structure of the project, as you may know, we have your DAX, and under your DAX, you store your DAX, per se, right? And what we can do is we can create a new folder, for example, called dbt, and we just push the dbt project under this folder. And then you can just run your dbt as you want. You're just programming the way that you like it. And in the end of the day, you're going to be able to leverage this uh, scheduling process through Airflow. So here you have your dbt projects under the DAX. So you use the dbt dash your project name. And here it's basically the Airflow DAG that invokes the project, right? And we used to have only this configuration available until the version 1.6, which is, uh, I've got like this latest news from Tatiana. She's one of the commuters of, of the Astronomer Cosmos. Um, and basically, what you can do now is that you can just make more agnostic. So a lot of uh, customers ask about, I don't want to push all my project inside of the DAX folder. I would like to leave it outside of this. And now you can do it. You can just basically push your dbt project to a manifest. So you just make the manifest of your dbt. And then you're going to be able to store it on GCS, blob storage, and S3. And then you can invoke from there. So that's a super cool thing. Awesome. So you specify the commands about telling, pointing to the project. And the magic is going to happen, right? So you're going to have the UI airflow showing all the lineage and all the the, the, the basic stuff and all the, the seeds operator, the run low operator. So it's going to behave as an airflow. And that's the beauty of that, to make seamless this integration between these two projects. But it's not only that. It's, uh, uh, Astronomer Cosmos extends the integration between DBT and airflow way more further because it offers different ways in how you can operate and how you can use it, right? So we have like lots of things here. I'm going to go over really rapidly um, around this once, but we're going to have more, more, more into the next slides. We have the recommended methods. So you can install locally. You can install on GCS for uh, on managed workflows for Apache Airflow. You can install basically anywhere. So inside of the documentation, for example, if you're hosting your Airflow on um, MWAA, you can simply go there, and you're going to have a documentation how to install it inside it. The same for Google Cloud Composer, and of course, the Astro, which is going to make way seamless for you to use and leverage this. We have execution modes. There's like different execution modes that you can use, and we're going to speak a little bit about that in a minute. And we have something that I really enjoy about profiles. So how you manage connections and passwords regarding your data warehousings, right? So usually what we do on the dbt project, we either pass for a parameter or we store in a variable um, the information inside of the profile.yaml. But what you can do is you can extend the capability of these integrating these two projects, and actually you can just delegate to a profile. So for example, if you're using, let's say, Google BigQuery, you can have this connector inside of Airflow, the connector BigQuery, and then you can just call from there and basically, you don't have to store any sensitive information in your profiles.yaml file, which is super cool. We have the scheduling, um, the time base. That's, we already know that since the, the beginning of Airflow. And there's this new data warehouse scheduling, which is a game changer for Apache Airflow in overall. So Astro also offers uh, integration and offers the possibility for you to use a data warehouse scheduling. Quick question. Who doesn't know about data warehouse scheduling? Raise a hand. OK, everybody. OK, so everybody's up to date. Congrats. Um, documentation, uh, yeah, they, we, we have possibility to start your documentation in different places, S3, GCS, and Azure Blob Storage. And also, we have this dbt docs operator, which is a callback. Essentially, you can just store anywhere you want. And the super important parsing methods. So we're going to discuss a little bit more of this on the next slides. But basically, it's how you select to perform your dbt project. How do you select to do a parsing of all your dbt project? OK, so how do I, you know, the, the first uh, session where I showed you a little bit of code was super simple. So now we're extending a little bit, and there's like some points that I would like to highlight here. So as you can see here, for example, on the profile config, right? So you're saying the name of your profile. And as you can see, there's a profile mapping 
that maps the Postgres user password, which means that I'm going to retrieve that information instead of the profiles.yaml. I'm going to go to the pro Postgres, and basically I'm going to retrieve the information from there. So we're going to store securely that information inside of a batch airflow. We have the execution config, which is how you would like to operate the execution. Uh, I'm going to explain a little bit further. And you can also use, okay, um, let me just stop for a second. Task flow API is a big thing on Airflow as well. So is there anyone here that doesn't know about the batch uh, task, airflow, uh, task flow API? Raise your hand. Okay, everybody knows, that's perfect. So we are simplifying the way that we structure the code and here just calling a DBT task group. And as you can see, we're just passing the basic parameters to that and they're gonna build the whole, construct the whole manifest and the whole image for you. Exactly this one that I showed before. So it's gonna build automatically um, the image for you. And the lineage and all the process. Yeah, and I think now the question is, what about best practices? So if you're starting right now, if you're just putting your feet um, you know, um, in water and starting to experiment the storm of cosmos, what are the things that I should be aware of? What are the important things that I should know? And there's a, there's a some of them, but I highlighted two. I think just these two is really important once you're starting to interact with Cosmos. The first one is the execution mode. The execution mode is basically how you choose to operate inside of your DBT project. So we, we, when we have more options than this. We have local, virtual, Docker, Kubernetes, Azure Contain Instance, and Amazon EKS, if I'm not mistaken. So essentially, what you can say is through th that truly depends on your environment, right? But what we usually see more happening is people use either local or Kubernetes. Those are the most used ones. And as you can see, for each one of them, you're gonna have like a little bit of drawback depending how you utilize it. So the local is the default method and hence the fast fastest way. So the does not install the DBT, so assumes that DBT binary is reachable through this DBT executable path. And starting from 1.4, it tries to do the partial parsing. That's really clever. So DBT partial parsing something from DBT, so essentially it tries to, instead of reading the whole manifest, it runs incrementally. It reads incrementally. So uh, Cosmos already leveraged that as well, so that, that's really good. Uh, we have the virtual web, the Docker, and the Kubernetes. So is there anyone here that have Airflow on Kubernetes? Raise your hand. Okay, 30%, 40, okay, interesting. Yeah, so Kubernetes is, is it's super useful because you can pretty much isolate everything and you can run in different pods. So that's so, gonna be super useful for you. Key takeaway two, parsing method. Yeah, that one, I can spend a little bit, a minute or two talking about it, but the parsing method is basically how you choose to render your, your, your DBT project. So there's like some options here, and we're gonna see a little bit about them. So we have the automatic, the DBT manifest, DBT LS, DBT LS file, and custom. So bottom line here is when we start to when you start with, with the astronomer cosmos, I think most likely you're gonna use the automatic. So it's gonna to try to do the best for you. But as your project, project evolves and gets bigger, then eventually you're gonna have like, you're gonna end up with a lot of models and a little bit of complexity on it. That's where you're gonna to start to look, for example, for different methods. Because in Airflow, there's like a lot of thresholds. And if you exceed like 30 seconds, whatever, in trying to render the DAG, it doesn't show up in the UUI. So I faced this problem like a dozen of times. Uh, I had like a DBT project with 300, uh, 300 models to run, and I was just pushing to automatic. And then, yeah, it, it, it's important to, to mention that I was using V.1.3 in that time, but the DAG was not showing up. So basically what I had to do is, I had to delegate the DBT manifest. So this is another way in how you could operationalize the DBT Cosmos. It's basically parsing the manifest.json, which is inside of the DBT. So you just point from the airflow, you just point to the manifest.json, and then you generate this through a CI CD or manual step, 
And then from there, whenever you push the, the parsing method, the parse process on DBT Cosmo, on Cosmos, it actually is gonna look for the manifest.json instead of doing an LS and trying to render all the process. And basically I was testing like some performance things regarding the types, right? So without the manifest, so it was running automatic, it took me 6.5 seconds to render the whole DAG. Whereas when I try with the manifest.json, it took me 0.35 seconds. Now, important to say that after version 1.5, 1.5, that thing got improved quite a lot. So I still recommend you to try to use automatic as much as you can because it makes super easy and simple for us to leverage. And if you start to face problems during rendering your DAG or just running them, then you should experiment dbt manifest. Okay, so that would be my recommendation.